Okay, hi, welcome. Uh, if you're here, you're here for session 322, how to be your best advocate for surgery. Um, let me in my, introduce myself and then I'll get back to the, the uh, name of our session here. My name is Abby Melendez. I'm a nearly 25 year uh, thyroid cancer survivor, uh, follicular variant papillary carcinoma. I, my husband and I uh, facilitate a group on Long Island, New York. I also do the RAI resistance support group virtually, and I'm the coordinator for all FICA support groups. Uh, again, if you're here, you're at session 322, how to be your best advocate for surgery. Uh, we have moderator Sarah Altman, an endocrine surgeon, uh, along with panelist Anupam Cotwell, who's an endocrinologist, uh, Kimberly Vanderveen, who's an endocrine surgeon, and James Wu, who's an endocrine surgeon. Uh, we'll let these people do their thing. Good morning and welcome to everybody online as well. Um, this is a, it's our pleasure to be invited for the, um, the Psyche meeting and doing this as a joint session um, sponsored with uh, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Um, for our cancer, we, <clears throat> we usually have an online panel as well. Um, for our Thyroid Cancer Awareness Month in September. Um, and today, as we've already heard, we have some endocrine surgeons as well as an endocrinologist to kind of talk to you a little bit about the nuances of the surgical management of thyroid cancer. So we'll start with a few questions from, uh, for each panelist. And then from there, we can kind of grow off of it for any questions that um, our attendees may have. And just as a quick reminder, we will be speaking in very general terms. We don't wanna get into any very nuanced personal um, medical decision-making or clinical scenarios. So <clears throat> let's um, start by asking each of the panelists what they think is the most important part of being your own best medical advocate. Um, so what are some of the different ways that uh, Dr. Wu, you feel we should be advocating for ourselves as patients? Uh, sure, I'm happy to speak on that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so in my mind, in how you be your best advocate, especially when you show up for that very first visit uh, with the endocrinologist or surgeon that you're meeting, uh, I think that it's really important that uh, you prepare for that uh, by writing down all of the different questions that you may have. And that's because uh, when you show up and we start with our own spiel, sometimes it's easy to uh, feel rushed and not get to all your questions. So having that prepared ahead of time is really important. You know, when, as a surgeon, when I meet a new patient, uh, I think that the things that we really need to talk about are one, getting a comprehensive uh, look at the whole situation, which usually includes a thorough examination of the patient uh, and their neck with ultrasound. So we can start at the same starting point in discussing what treatments are needed. And just for patients to know that there's a wide variety of acceptable treatments uh, for the same kind of thyroid cancer. And many surgeons and endocrinologists may disagree on what is best. So getting a, a variety of different opinions uh, can also really help make sure that you uh, get all the knowledge because some people have, you know, very specific preferences and patterns. Uh, and unless you kind of ask more widely what else is acceptable, uh, you may not get the full menu of options. And Dr. Caldwell, for the um, upcoming new release of the American Thyroid Association's um, recommendations also building off of the current ones from 2015. Um, can you talk a little bit about for differentiated thyroid cancer consideration of lobectomy alone when the cancer is less than four centimeters? Um, how do patients decide whether that's the right thing for them to do a lobectomy versus a total? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, you know, the change kind of updates in the guidelines are based on studies that showed that small thyroid cancers do very well after they are managed by a lobectomy that is taking out that side where the cancer cancer was. Again, I think before this decision is made, you want to make sure that you have had a comprehensive neck evaluation of neck ultrasound done 
um, by you know uh, specialists with expertise in there to make sure that there is no lateral neck lymph nodes that have that have been missed, uh, because technically there could be a small little tumor in your thyroid gland, but then lymph nodes that are large. So that whole you know you need a total thyroidectomy for that. Uh, on the other hand, there are cases where a tumor actually doesn't look very concerning, but then there's concerning lymph nodes. But I think if once the it's been decided that the tumor is in a specific loop um, and it's not kind of on the ultrasound, we don't see any concerns for it spreading out or extension. I think then it's a reasonable consideration. Um, there's a few things that go, go into this. And I think this is where um, the, the patients um, uh, kind of um, how much they know about their own decision and how kind of how much would they be worried about this. So a few things that we take into account is, you know, just taking one lobe has a lower risk of affecting your parathyroid glands and nerves. Um, but keeping that in mind that if you are going to an expert surgeon, a high volume surgeon, those risks are low in general. Um, the other thing is if there are nodules on the other side, um, sometimes it can be tough to monitor those. And if so, they're slightly concerning. Some people may choose to have the whole thyroid taken out. Uh, but if they're very low suspicion nodules that have been proven benign, then it's still okay to take out one lobe. Um, and then the third thing comes back is tumor marker, this thyroglobulin, which we follow. So if you have one lobe that still remains, then we really cannot follow it well. Um, so if you know, I ask pa patients and kind of think of this myself, like if we're going to lose sleep over this, like, oh, maybe there is some tiny little thing on the other side. And if you're not going to be able to have a good quality of life, then maybe you wouldn't choose to have a lobectomy. But if you have a good team, you're going to follow up with regular neck ultrasounds. You have a small tumor in a one area. You've had good evaluation done. Then I think it's reasonable to just kind of have a localized surgery with knowing that in the future, you may need a completion or even after that lobectomy, if there are features of invasion, you may still need a completion uh, thyroidectomy. Um, so I guess those are things that go into it. And sometimes it's not an easy decision. If a tumor is like three centimeter or 3.5 centimeter, you know, it's less than four, but it's close by. And then it's a little bit of a discussion. And a lot of it is depends on the perceptions and behavior of the patient and how they would kind of uh, deal with this after one side is taken out. Um, so some of those things, and I think uh, um, fortunately with high volume surgeons, you know, our risk of complications are not high. Uh, one thing I don't want to forget is endocrinologist thyroid hormone. I didn't even, uh, so that's the, I guess the fourth thing with lobectomy, um, your risk of requiring thyroid hormone is less. It's not zero. Uh, most patients with thyroid cancer will require thyroid hormone replacement. So, you know, if your TSH is already kind of high normal, a little bit high, you probably will require thyroid hormone. And some people may choose to have a total if they know that either way, they're going to be on thyroid hormone replacement. But we do know like getting completely uh, deficient in thyroid hormone, people do feel a little bit worse than if they're slightly deficient. So that's the other thing, you know, the whole thyroid hormone deficiency. And I, you know, if, if the patient feels that being completely deficient will impact their life a lot. On the other hand, they have a small tumor that's localized. I think it's very reasonable to then consider a lobectomy or resection of that side where the tumor is. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, Dr. Vanderveen, as a surgeon, when you're seeing these patients in your office, what are some additional things that you look for technically to be able to help the patient? What's What other factors are there besides this just magic number of the mass itself. So again, that, that staging ultrasound, um, the lymph node staging is really important for us to be able to make that decision in, a, in addition to, again, are there nodules or other concerns on the other side? Um, and again, what is their baseline thyroid function as we're talking about that? Um, I find a lot of my patients, their thyroid cancer was found on accident. Um, and so again, this was a, a surprise, um, and they may be dealing with other medical conditions that might, um, play a role in, in how they feel and what their values or concerns are. Um, especially I, I see a lot of patients that maybe this was found during a breast cancer, um, staging or evaluation or follow-up. Um, and so I, I tell a lot of my patients when we're trying to decide, you know, do we just do a conservative approach, a single-sided surgery, or to take the whole thyroid out? Again, considerations medically of nodal staging, 
treatment plan and, and whether or not we think we might want them to be a radioactive iodine candidate, um, local extension, or again, is it a contained tumor? And then baseline thyroid function and then the fear factor. And so I, I go, how afraid of you are, be, are, are you of being dependent on lifelong thyroid hormone replacement? Um, which again, you might need a supplement if, if we even keep the one side, but how afraid of you are that of, of the thyroid hormone versus how are afraid of you are leaving the other side in place? Or is that cause you concern at night? Can you sleep at night? Um, and the follow-up plan that comes into place. Um, and so again, I see a lot of patients from rural locations that actually travel um, to see us for medical care. And so that's another consideration that comes into play of how difficult is it going to be to follow a residual thyroid? Um, do they have access to care? Do they have access to an endocrinologist in the region that they're in? And so all of those things come into play. Um, Dr. Wu, for many of the patients um, that are, or many of the individuals here attending FICA, they've already had their initial surgery. Um, what about for those patients when they're facing a recurrence um, what are the most important parts of the evaluation and management that uh, patients need to be aware of for recurrent disease um, and what might be indications to them um, about seeking a second opinion with those recurrences depending on the number of them? Uh, so I think that the initial part, uh, not to say the same thing again, but uh, it is very important to have a uh, good preparation with a good list of questions first, followed by a very thorough examination uh, with neck ultrasound. Uh, recurrences can uh, commonly happen either in the thyroid bed or other common areas are behind the carotid or the high lymph nodes near the ear. Uh, and sometimes in uh, more difficult situations, where you know that the burden is a little bit outside the bounds of the ultrasound, you may actually want to get other kinds of imaging as well. Uh, once you've had that imaging, then you need to carefully review with your surgeon uh, what surgery has been done before, because when a recurrence happens in a place that has not seen surgery, if the lymph node is on the side of the neck that has not had surgery, then that, even though it is going back for another operation, is not a re-operation, not entering back into a scarred area. But if they're going back into the area next to the thyroid where surgery has been done, now scar tissue has developed there, and now the risks of the surgery start to increase because instead of seeing, seeing clearly this is trachea, this is the nerve to the, the vocal cord, and now it's kind of webbed together by scar tissue. So if it's truly reoperative field, the risks are a little higher. You need to be a little bit more careful about a few things. One, you need to know the status of the vocal cords and the vocal cord nerves, because if any of the vocal cords have been compromised by previous surgery, which unfortunately does happen some of the time, it really changes the level of risk going into the reoperation. Because if one side has already been compromised, then operating on the other side now risks a bilateral injury, which could lead to needing really dramatic and serious things like tracheostomies. And so then there's this careful balancing of risk versus benefit. How much risk are we willing to undertake? Because like Anupam said, normally we think of these things as very low risk, but with reoperations, they start to climb higher and higher. And finally, with recurrences, we have to think about, I know it's really scary to deal with either a rising level of thyroglobulin or seeing something in the neck that's small, or even getting something biopsied and proving to ourselves that there is a small piece of thyroid cancer somewhere and the desire to act on it immediately. Let's get this out now. But I think we all know uh, that uh, for the majority of thyroid cancers, which are papillary, they are slow growing. And we knew that patients still enjoy a good prognosis despite them being there and not to overreact and overtreat, because if you jump in, you could cause harm. Sometimes we even may miss really small lymph nodes if we try to get in too early. So a very careful and thorough discussion with your surgeon uh, is paramount. And you know, uh, high volume is something that we always point to. So sometimes your thyroid surgeon may be very comfortable with the thyroid, but not with the lymph nodes. So studies have shown you want your surgeon to do at least 
seven central neck dissections a year, three to four lateral neck dissections a year. That's really not a lot. You know, most surgeons can meet those numbers, but you do want to ask uh, when you're heading into a reoperation. And we've got one question from, actually there's two in our, our Q&A session. Um, Dr. Vanderveen, are there any scans patients can have done ahead of time to help you know about the scar tissue or what, um, how do you know where to anticipate the scar tissue? So unfortunately, none of the scans show scar tissue. That's, that's the downside for us as surgeons. So we have to just anticipate it. Um, how do we anticipate it? We like to know what surgery was done before. So a lot of us will request prior records um, to get a sense of you know, what was the extent of the prior surgery and what were the bounds of where we expect the scar tissue to be. Everybody scars, um, but each person's a little bit different in how their body makes scar tissue. And so sometimes we just don't know. Um, I think a lot of us that do a lot of thyroid surgery also see patients that have had scar tissue from other types of surgery. Um, like spine fusion surgeries and things like that. Um, so I think, again, this goes back to the volume issue that Dr. Wu was addressing that, you know, when you're talking about thyroid surgery, especially thyroid cancer surgery, volume is really important and having a surgeon that knows what they're doing and particularly understands some of this nuance of the decision-making about thyroid cancer and being able to um, address your concerns and values and then technically being able to manage any scar tissue, being able to monitor your vocal cord nerves, being um, astute about finding and preserving parathyroid tissue. Um, and then again, not missing anything and having an adequate workup and good surgical plan are really important. Um, and so again, you know, at the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, we're recommending surgeons for this type of surgery that are doing at least 50 cases per year um, for, for thyroid cancer specifically. Um, and I guess just to echo from the, the patient standpoint, um, being able to have copies of your original operative records if you're not going back to the same surgeon is one way to really give the, the new surgeon the, the best idea. Where was that previous operation done? Where should they be anticipating that scar tissue to be in within you? Um, another question before we move on is uh, going back from the question about lobectomy versus total, uh, total Dr. Cotwall, does patient age factor in at all when um, considering lobectomy versus total for differentiated thyroid cancer? Um, to a certain extent, yes. So, you know, um, there's kind of different ways to look at it. On the one hand, we know that, you know, the prognosis is usually good if we're younger than age 55. I mean, that's how the staging uh, came about as well. Um, but on the flip side, the younger you are, the longer follow-up you will probably get if we leave one lobe there. Um, so it's a kind of a nuanced discussion. Um, it's kind of easier at the uh, kind of uh, extremes of age. If someone is fairly young, then we are a little bit more kind of likely to have a consideration for total thyroidectomy. Um, on the other hand, if someone has multiple comorbidities and kind of maybe undergoing screening or having other malignancies and is much older, then you know localized to really kind of make sure we're not causing them more issues with their quality of life and voice and scarring and all those issues. Um, but otherwise, it's more of a kind of a perception of the patient, like how how will they feel with some of this follow up? Can they actually come for some of this follow up uh, and have the resources? Uh, for that. Um, so I, I think age plays to a certain extent, but I think it's not uh, like the, not the only factor. Yeah. And then another one for you, Dr. Cotwall. Um, we do have a fairly well-informed audience. They've, they found Psycho, which is an amazing resource for them. What other resources are there for patients with thyroid cancer who haven't had surgery yet? How do they help seek out not just a surgeon, but potentially even a medical endocrinologist? Yeah, so I mean, the American Thyroid Association has um, a list for endocrinologists to specialize in thyroid disorders. So they will be um, at least either being uh, having ability to interpret thyroid ultrasounds or do their own ultrasounds and um, uh, work in kind of that multidisciplinary team with surgeons and radiologists, etc. Uh, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons has resources on that as well. And then, of course, um, uh, Thyca, as we know. Um, 
<clears throat> Dr. Vanderveen, how should how do patients know that the surgeon is the right fit for them? Um, well, you know, everybody's different. So um, I think really that's when you meet with your surgeon and you just decide, is this somebody that I can have a trust relationship with? Is this someone that's listening to me? Um, is this someone that's addressing my concerns and answering my questions? Um, again, from the technical standpoint of, of just, we've talked about volume being really important. That's a really good screening tool. Um, I also recommend patients consider having a second opinion in meeting, meeting more than one surgeon and deciding who fits the best with them. And I think that's true for the whole team, because again, as we say for thyroid cancer, you know, it's not one and done. This is a lifelong um, survivorship plan. And so you need to have a team with you um, that's going to address your concerns and answer your questions. So again, I think being prepared when you come to that appointment, having your list of questions, and then meeting with the surgeon and saying, is this a personality fit with me? Can I trust this person um, getting, getting me through this operation? Because it's scary. Yeah. And then Dr. Wu, both from a standpoint, if you are seeing someone in a second opinion or your patient tells you up front, hey, I want to get a second opinion, what's the surgeon's perception of that? Um, I think many patients are a little bit scared of going that route. I think that um, you should never, as a patient, be afraid of uh, seeking out a second opinion. And I think that uh, any physician that, you know, seems upset or perturbed by you seeking a second opinion um, would be, I think, abnormal and, and I think uh, may not be, you know, looking out for you. Uh, so, but, you know, the good news is, is that I think virtually all of us, especially uh, within endocrinology, endocrine surgery, having uh, met many patients with thyroid cancer and treated them, that we're all very open to that idea. And, you know, a thing that we should all know now is that with Zoom, with telemedicine, it's actually very easy for you to uh, look across the United States, look for other areas that you can just simply speak to uh, another endocrinologist, endocrine surgeon, just to hear their differences of opinion. Because believe me, there are wide variations in practice across the country, or sometimes even within an institution. Some groups will say we only perform total thyroidectomy. Some groups say we always perform total thyroidectomy and we remove the central neck lymph nodes. And so there's going to be a wide variety of opinions and you kind of need to hear it from all sides to help make the choice that's best for you. And, you know, I think that most places are happy to receive and give those second opinions and they will still encourage you to have surgery close to home. Uh, and so they understand that you know, sometimes just talking is the point of the visit. Um, and I guess just one thing to, to add, um, you know, if you're going to see a surgeon who's part of a large group, sometimes the group policy um, to prevent patients from doctor hopping within the same group is to not allow second opinions within that group. It's not that they don't want you to seek a second opinion, but it's more so as a collective group, we have a shared philosophy. And so you're not actually going to get a, a different answer by meeting someone new from the group. Um, but we're the group should still be very amenable to helping you find someone else in the area or region. Um, or these websites may be an additional option for you to find what's close to home. Can we have a question from uh, the audience here? <laughs> Uh, we, you referred to um, American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and ATA as resources for um, finding your doctors. Um, what qualifies or what criteria do you have to meet to be in the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons? Um, so I think that uh, to be in the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, each surgeon that would like to be a member has to submit for membership, which includes uh, documentation of your training, as well as the number of endocrine cases you've done over a certain period of time. Um, I think what is on the horizon, which um, is not solidified yet, but is coming, is something called a focus practice designation by the American Board of Surgery. And it, shared with the American Board of Otolaryngology as well. That's right. That uh, It's not going to be only endocrine surgeons that otolaryngologists, also known as ENTs or head and neck surgeons, 
uh, will also be able to participate in that. Because again, across different hospital systems, sometimes all thyroid cases are done by ENTs. Sometimes they're done all by endocrine surgeons. We have another question. Hi, it's not a question, but it, and it's not surgery related, but it's relevant. <laughs> um, and I would like to preface it by saying a lot has changed over the last quarter century, and unfortunately, a lot hasn't. And you've talked about going into appointments with a list of questions. And I went to my endocrinologist with a list of questions, and he rushed me through because he was afraid that I was going to take up too much of his time because I had a list of questions. So yes, that's certainly a red flag to me to change doctors, which I did. <laughs> but I would also, I'm very happy. In, in our support groups, we will often encourage other members of the support group to do the list of questions. I'm very happy to hear the recommendation coming from the healthcare professionals. And I hope I can encourage you to find out if any of your colleagues are behaving the way I experienced and encourage them not to. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you very much for that comment. I think the, the videos that we were watching last night, being able to see some of the, um, the patient physician interactions and just see all the different ways that they can look is also very eye opening and um, a good, a good example that um, we all are human and, and have room for improvement. We have another question. More of a comment also is, you know, to come to the appointment prepared and at, you know, in the initial visit, I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what questions to ask, or I've done a little bit of research. And I think that was the most frustrating thing is I have bits and pieces, but I, I had a difficult time putting it together. And that was what compounded the fear, you know, so just I don't know what I don't know. So part of, you know, the physician's job is to help educate me on, on what I don't know. Can I just add, yeah, I, so I hear, you know, we're humans from the side of physicians and from survivors, caregivers, patients too. All of us have different personalities. So I think it, usually I think, and all of us probably do this, like we would ask the person like, okay, what have you understood about, about this you know, if they were already been diagnosed with cancer, or they're coming with a nodule, because there'll be people who would have done their research and have the questions and they know other people who had this and other people like, oh, someone said there's something in my neck and I'm here, right? Why not? We're not going to personal things, but we all have different personalities or they may be overwhelmed by their other medical condition and suddenly this tumor has been found. So we want to start from there and then kind of build on that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think we always expect the person to come in all prepared, right? So yeah, that's. Um, and, and for anybody watching, I think that there are a lot of good resources, including I, I've actually browsed through some of the Thyca uh, brochures. The ATA has a committee uh, for patient advocacy and education, and they make flyers about questions to ask a provider when you meet, as well as some researchers. I know Susan Pitt is a very prolific researcher who has made a, a questions guide for patients. Uh, so those are good resources for patients to look into. I'm just going to add to that, the piece too of if you can bring someone with you to your appointment, I think that's super helpful. There's good research that shows that patients maybe at best remember 50% of what was said in an appointment, because a lot of times the appointments are rushed. It's overwhelming. You're having thoughts and emotions. And, and then again, your concentration may not be there for the entire thing. And so if you can have a second set of ears um, to, so that you can replay that, um, some, some physicians do not allow you, you to record their conversations and others do. Um, if you are going to record, you, it is common courtesy to ask first. Um, but I would encourage people, you can ask, um, and a lot of us allow the patients to record the conversation so that they can play it back over again and hear different things the next time around. Um, or again, my patients will take notes sometimes. Um, so bringing somebody else with you, going to the um, American Endocrine um, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons website and pulling off the, the patient questionnaire of to help you form that base list and understanding this is a learning process all the way through. And so you're not going to know everything right away. It's going to be something where you pick up a little more and a little bit more. And as you learn more things and talk to more people, you'll have more questions for the next time. Um, and so we don't expect you to get all of your questions answered in, in one sitting. 
um, we know new things are going to happen and new questions are going to come up. Yeah, I, d I just wanted to say um, my husband always accompanies me and I do with his appointments as well. But I know that there are some times when uh, I especially during COVID, while it was really quite pro prolific, I guess, uh, they had people had would uh, ask the doctors, could they call their significant other, you know, and do the FaceTime type of thing. My, my only other comment would have been, um, and I know this, I'm not talking about any of you, but there are some doctors who will say, hey, it's thyroid, you got the good cancer, so please. And I know that nobody ever said that to me because I, would, I, mean, I know I would have had something to say to them. But you know, if you can speak to some of those people in, in, uh, you know, in your fields and maybe they can learn, uh, reframe and say, perhaps it's, you might have a more treatable type of thyroid cancer, but that I, I, I'm, I believe I'm speaking for pre pretty much everybody. So uh, there's that. No, those of us that are involved in training, um, not just at the fellow level, but all along in the lower levels of the residency training and, and medical student training, do try to emphasize that, that the word cancer is a very powerful word and patients don't have this perspective of multiple different types of cancer experiences. They have their own, and especially when they're hearing that word for the first time, there's so many very powerful triggering emotions that come along with it. And to have someone so blatantly downplay that is, is just wrong. Um, we have another question from the Zoom attendees. When going back for a recurrence or persistence, um, should patients have a different list of questions to ask the surgeon? Um, Dr. Codwall, what do you think? Okay, well, yeah, so I would kind of echo that, you know, there may be surgeons who've done a lot of thyroid are maybe very comfortable with that, but ask like how many times they've done reoperations, how many times have they, or kind of gone back on previously operated necks, um, lateral neck, et cetera, things like that. Um, with that, it also, I think the surgeon, and then there's the team that kind of then will uh, talk about potential for radioactive iodine or depending on different cancers and extension, maybe some local radiation uh, in some cases. So how does that team look? And usually, I think surgeons who are have expertise in reoperating uh, or going into operated necks or lateral necks will probably be working with with those teams. Um, yeah, I think when talking about going back for recurrent or persistent disease, um, again, making sure that we have really good staging information and really good surgical planning in place. Um, is really important, but I think really understanding which compartments that we're talking about that disease is in and what the risks are in those compartments, and then asking some really pointed questions about um, how do you manage or monitor my vocal cord nerves and how, how do you find or protect my parathyroids in a reoperative setting, um, and the, the question of timing, when? Um, because we have a lot of patients that we watch and wait for a, a period of time of, of when is the appropriate time to go in. And that's a team-based decision about, do we need to do it now? Can we make some adjustments in thyroid hormone? Is this you know clinically stable disease where it makes more sense to wait and live with it than it does to operate and take the risk of those complications? And so I'm, I'm, I'll give the mic back to you, Dr. Almeyer, and let you say what, what you would do as a surgeon as well. Um, I guess the other question, because um, I think we've been talking about reoperation and persistence, um, let's talk a little bit about the situation of completion thyroidectomy, where we're going back in to potentially remove the residual, somebody's gone down the road of lobectomy, and now for um, what are some of the different scenarios they may have to go back in for completion thyroidectomy, Dr. Wu? And is that considered, would you consider that a reoperative operation in that case? Or is that the situation you mentioned where it's sort of an untouched compartment? Um, so I'm going to start my answer by saying that there's a lot of gray in this. So please don't, we may disagree, even among us, about when it is needed. Uh, so uh, the need for completion thyroidectomy comes up a lot and it'll come up more and more now that we're doing uh, thyroid lobectomies for thyroid cancer. 
Uh, and oftentimes it comes up when we operate on indeterminate thyroid nodules, when we're not sure if there's a cancer, and then we find one. Um, and so what are the different things that come up that make us think, oh, this person may need a completion, and we start that conversation? I think there are some things that you, you look at and you say, oh, we of course have to do it. And there's going to be a lot of, well, maybe we need to do it, uh, but we'll have a conversation. But you know, what is the goal of completion thyroidectomy? When we do a thyrolobectomy, it's because we're removing all of the cancer. And so now by doing the thyrolobectomy, all of the cancer has been removed. So why are we going and trying to remove the normal half of the thyroid? Does it cut out any more cancer? It doesn't. But what it does do is two things. One, it allows you to give radioactive iodine, which is predominantly the reason for doing the completion thyroidectomy. Uh, and then number two, as was mentioned, is that you can follow uh, tumor markers, thyroglobulin, to see if the cancer is coming back. But usually people who have already made their peace with getting a thyroid lobectomy already made a decision that that wasn't the most important thing. So let's just focus on whether you need radioactive iodine. So we know that radioactive iodine helps when people are at the highest risk of recurrence. And that is when you have very large lymph nodes, which usually you find out and you wouldn't have done a lobectomy for that anyway. So you find out the highest risk is when there's intense vascular invasion or what there is extra thyroidal extension, the tumor is growing out of the thyroid. And you see that at the time of surgery, when you've already agreed upon a lobectomy and you didn't do the other side. After that, a lot of gray area. What do you do with a one millimeter lymph node that you didn't even intend to remove, but you removed it anyway. And now we know that a small speck has gone to the lymph nodes. What happens when you have a tall cell variant or a higher risk variant? In these cases, you need to have a very uh, intense discussion because there's not a lot of clear evidence that getting radioactive iodine will actually improve outcomes or give benefit. And so each patient can make a decision for themselves. Do I want to do the most or am I comfortable doing what is probably acceptable and not completion? These are big things to think about. One last thing, and then I'll hand it over, uh, is that the only other difference is that if you have a positive margin, which means the pathologist looks at the specimen and says, oh, I see cancer cells on the edge. So then it becomes a question of, well, are there still cancer cells on the other side, still inside? And I'll tell you that even though that that sounds very clear, it is not clear. Because when you are using our device, which is called a cautery device, we don't actually cut with a knife, we cut with an energy device, it kind of burns all the tissue around. So the pathologist is looking at this lump of tissue, the edge is kind of burnt, and they're not really clear on whether there are cells that are still alive or not on that edge. And there's been a lot of studies talking about, does margin status matter? And they don't all agree. So even when there's a positive margin, sometimes it needs re-review by the pathologist. Sometimes you need to talk to the surgeon. There's a lot of nuance in these discussions. Yeah, I think I'd echo that for sure. As far as the surgeon kind of knows if we're cutting through gross, gross tumor to try to say something like the nerve to your voice and trying to balance that. Um, and so it's a little bit of a putting both parts together, what was seen in the operating room and felt by the operative surgeon and how does that correlate or not correlate with what they see underneath the microscope. Um, changing directions just a little bit and it's gonna match up very nicely with the new question we have in the chat. Um, so Dr. Cotwell, in addition to surgery, what other things should patients be thinking about long-term um, as they start their thyroid cancer journey? And at, you know, how do they know the frequency of their follow-up? What are the modalities of follow-up? You know, is everyone getting an uptake scan every year? Is everyone just doing ultrasound, thyroglobulin? Um, how, what is the de-escalation path and, and who's appropriate for de-escalation? So that's, I think that's 10 questions in one, but I will do it. <laughs> So I think, um, you know, so after the surgery, we look at the risk, right? Low risk of cancer coming back or spreading, intermediate, and then high. Um, and so radioactive iodine plays into that, right? For high risk and maybe kind of intermediate to high risk role, not much for low. And then there's a little bit of gray zone in, in between there. Um, and then after that, some of it depends. If you had a tiny little 
thyroid cancer, very low risk. We actually don't do like much at until maybe three or even six months uh, and probably would do ultrasound at that time. And um, really, there is not very frequent follow-up. On the other hand, if you're a high-risk thyroid cancer, you got radioactive iodine, um, then we are. Then actually we check things at six weeks, six to eight weeks, three months, six months, yearly for them, at least till five years. And that's where the thyroid hormone replacement and the TSH suppression, getting a little bit more thyroid hormone than you uh, probably require and all of those things play into play a role. So is that initial risk, which we know usually after surgery and then how the behavior has been. So are the tumor markers going up? Is there small little things that we're seeing in the ultrasound or the tumor markers have not even been measurable and we neck looks perfectly clear. So then we can start kind of spacing out those follow-ups. So for the lowest risk ones, um, sometimes we would alternate ultrasound and checking the tumor markers if it's been a few years and was a low risk cancer or even after five to six years, high risk, but treated well and you know excellent response, then we could start alternating that tumor marker and ultrasound at some point. And this, again, we don't have a lot of good data on this kind of long-term. Uh, at some point, we probably may just go to uh, blood test, tumor marker testing. Um, but so I, I think it de depends on your risk and how the behavior has been. Um, I think the team uh, is important that usually those follow-ups are done by endocrinologists, but sometimes by surgeons as well. So you want to know who is going to do this. And is this endocrinologist, someone who's, and I, I mean, we all start as generalists and then kind of get specialized, but what all are they doing? How frequently are they monitoring thyroid cancer patients? Or is it kind of one person in their large panel uh, and it may depend, you know, if you're 10 years out, maybe it doesn't matter as much. At some point, they could also go to a primary care. Uh, but maybe early on when uh, those discussions of radioiodine, et cetera, are happening, uh, you want to keep that in mind. Radioiodine scans, we usually do not do them unless the tumor marker is rising and our imaging is not showing much. And then we're trying to find is there some disease that is not showing up on kind of CAT scans and structural imaging, but it's not kind of standard. It used to be a little while ago before, I guess, I trained, but it used to be. Um, so things are changing as well. Um, and so you want to kind of be seeing a team that is aware of the advances that are happening, the studies that are kind of coming out showing that not everything that is a little bit positive may be concerned for kind of going back again in the neck. Not every small little lymph node that looks slightly concerning needs operation and probably could be could be washed also or things like that. I always digress a little bit with from the questions. I hope it is it is a little bit on track, but I guess that's what I would say. No, I Did I miss that, something? No, I think that um, covers all of it. Um, going on Dr. Vanderveen, when for recurrences, they can happen in different parts of the body. So what types of recurrences are appropriate to go back to the surgeon? What types of recurrences are appropriate for discussion, discussions on another round or an initial round of radioactive iodine or for some um, extreme cases, external beam? Uh, so I'm going to say it probably varies a lot um, by you know, where you are in the country of who's following your thyroid cancer. Um, and so in some areas of the country, your access point might be your endocrinologist. In some areas of the country, it might be your surgeon that's following you annually or doing this, this follow-up regimen for you. So I think it just depends on where your point of access to care is. Um, I think when you're starting to make decisions about a, an additional round of treatment, regardless of what that is, whether it's an additional round of um, iodine, whether it's a diff additional round of surgery, um, you want anybody that's got an interest in that involved in that decision making. So again, if there is structural disease, meaning that we're seeing lymph nodes or tumor that we can visibly see on imaging studies, you probably want your surgeon involved, at least in the discussion of is surgery an option or not, and the location and the risks of what that would entail, um, and your medical endocrinologist involved. It does it make sense um, at this point in time to treat this? Do we do iodine? Do we do radiation? And so I think location, 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 um, really important. And then behavior pattern of what's going on. And, and then again, it's, it's a pretty great discussion, I think, that's very individualized to your, your particular situation. But um, start with wherever your access point is, and then the team should, should kind of regroup around you. 
um, for distant metastases, what are the treatment options um, usually for those types of recurrences? Uh, so uh, for distant metastases, I think that uh, for differentiated thyroid cancers that we always consider whether we give additional radioactive iodine. Now we have to understand that each patient has a limited amount of radiation they can receive in their lifetime. So we kind of have to be measured in when we give it. Uh, once uh, tumors have uh, gone beyond being, uh, uh, they become resistant to the reactive iodine or people cannot get more, then there are targeted medications. Uh, they're called TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But these medications we know slow the growth of the thyroid cancer, but uh, they don't really do a good job of eradicating what is there. Uh, and so we tend to not give that right away when there's resistant disease, but rather we wait until there are signs of uh, rapidly increasing velocity of growth. And we decide as a team when to do that. And as Dr. Van Amin said, um, you know, depending on where they're happening, how many spots are lighting up, you know, some areas may be amenable to surgery, some may be amenable to uh, radiation, as you mentioned. Uh, so the most important thing is having this multidisciplinary team, a whole team of people who are specialized in looking at the thyroid cancer, kind of giving you an opinion. And uh, this, these situations, which are more rare, uh, this is when a really high volume institution becomes really important, a place that has access and knowledge of clinical trials, um, a place that has access and experience treating with TKIs, uh, or even more experimental things like immunotherapies. Um, so we have about 12 minutes left in our session. Um, so just for anyone who is on Zoom, please keep entering those questions in the chat box under, pardon me, not the chat box, but the question and answer. Um, is there any other questions from the room at this point? Um, if not, I guess Dr. Vanderveen, is any last thoughts from you about that you think are relevant to our discussion today? I'm just going to go back to the ad advocacy piece because that's the, uh, the title of our talk, of course. Again, I think I really love Thyke as an organization. And even as a provider, I sometimes learn what's new or what's going into clinical trials um, by the updates in the news that I get from the Thyco website. Um, so again, I think this is a great entry site. I think the um, American Association of Endocrine Surgeons has really great information. That's endocrinediseases.org, great patient information. Mayo Clinic site has great patient information. American Thyroid Association is going to be where you find all your clinical guidelines if you're at the type of patient that wants to look more at clinical guidelines, but there are so many good resources out there um, to educate yourself and at least start the process. And as you do that, you'll have more questions. And so then start writing those down so you can bring those to your team um, because your outcome is going to be better if you understand your disease, you understand the goals of treatment and that you and your providers have um, are in alignment um, on the goals of care um, so that you're all looking for the same thing. And then with reference to the guidelines, I know, um, I think we had been expecting them to be out this year. Um, do you, I am not aware of the current anticipated release date, whether it'll be next year or if it's getting pushed out. Do y'all have any insight? I don't know, but the last set took three, it seems like it took three extra years. So, yes. so, um, so we're hoping. You know, we, we are, for those of y'all asking online when they're going to be available, we, we are also asking the same questions. And uh, um, unfortunately at the moment, those of us in the room do, are, do not have the connections to know um, where that is, but that's come up actually in other meetings um, where the um, endocrinologists and, and surgeons have been asking the same questions too. But we've talked a little bit about um, lymph node disease and we've, we've talked a little bit about size. Can you, go into a bit of detail about um, how pathology reports might vary. Um, is, our all lymph, is all lymph node disease the same? Um, so uh, there is a, a wide spectrum of risks of recurrence with different amounts of lymph node disease. Um, one very curious thing about thyroid cancer is that, um, sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a story, but there was a big practice in endocrine surgeons where we used to all always, or some would always remove the central neck lymph nodes. 
They said, well, oftentimes we find little pieces of thyroid cancer in the lymph nodes next to the thyroid. Just to be safe, let's just take all those lymph nodes out. And for a while, that was common practice. There was a big paper published in 2014 where they compared this. Half of patients got those lymph nodes removed, half did not. And in the half that did, they looked through all those lymph nodes and they found little pieces of papillary thyroid cancer in nearly half of the patients that they removed the lymph nodes in. And yet when they looked at the long-term outcomes of both groups of patients, patients who kept their lymph nodes versus those who did not, their outcomes were exactly the same. So what did that teach us? It teaches us that it is very normal and very common to have very, very small pieces of thyroid cancer in the lymph nodes that actually does not impact your clinical outcome. And by going after them, you increase risk of complications without providing a benefit. Now, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, if you have very, very large lymph nodes, three, four centimeters, of course, that adds a lot of risk. But what I would say is this, is that the PATH report um, is one piece of the puzzle, but in thyroid cancer, we need to broaden how we think about time that in other cancers, you make one plan, you stick to the plan, and you do the treatment in that small time frame because they think that four to six months is all the time we have to act. In thyroid cancer, the time horizon is much longer. And one concept we don't talk about a lot is response to therapy in thyroid cancer. So even if you are ATA intermediate risk, ATA high risk, if you get checked on six months after your treatment and we see nothing on ultrasound, we see that your thyroid globulin has gone to zero if you've had a total thyroidectomy and you get placed into an excellent response category, your risk of recurrence is not the, what we told you at first, 40%, 60%. Now it's 2%. Now it's 14%. And that is a very unique thing to thyroid cancer. So I encourage all patients when they're nervous about these things that you know, just give it a little bit of time. If you don't know if you need reactive iodine, just let's check a thyroid globulin. It might be zero after the surgery. And then what are we treating? So um, there's a lot more time. And I guess we've talked a lot about the, the medical team that takes care of you for thyroid cancer, but there are other doctors that are technically part of your care team that you never see. And that's the pathologists and the pathology for thyroid cancer, especially for the more rare subtypes um, is very nuanced. And um, not all pathology reports are the same. I was just looking back at reports from several years ago and was from outside of the system where I work, um, where the report just simply gives a number of nodes, number positive, number negative. And that's inadequate to tease out this nuance we're talking about that um, ideally they really should be saying, what's the largest size of the tumor deposit in your lymph node? And the, of all the ones that are positive, and that really gives us a scale of the, what's called the disease burden, how much cancer actually has escaped into those lymph nodes. Um, and so that's where you know, many of your path reports may just simply have the, the number of lymph nodes and not actually any mention of the size of the lymph nodes that were positive. Um, it's also making sure they're giving you the size of the cancer deposit and not just the lymph node, because those are two very different things. Um, and they have different treatment implications. And so, you know, you can always ask for a pathology re-review as well. It can get sent elsewhere for them to try to get that information too. But the pathologist, both with your initial biopsy and your final pathology are just as integral to your treatment team as your surgeons and your medical endocrinologists. There are no more questions, and thank you so very much. Have a great rest of your afternoon, and uh, thanks for being here.